I'm quite literally unable to use any type of technology unless it has accessibility features baked in. And that's not just the case for me, but millions upon millions of people worldwide who are either born with a disability or have to live with one later on in life. Now between you and me, this is probably the most vulnerable I've ever been in any of my videos because since I was really young, I've always had bad vision, but since I was four, I've been blind in my right eye. And since 2019, due to a whole bunch of complications, I've been left with very low vision in my left eye, which is my only remaining eye, and have therefore since been forced to use any type of technology with accessibility features to get the most out of them and to literally just function in daily life. I promise you, this is all important context because I got the amazing opportunity to sit down with Sarah Herlinger, Apple's Senior Director of Global accessibility policy and initiatives and have a discussion about Apple's approach when it comes to accessibility in tech. To begin with, the very first question I asked from Sarah was, at what stage in Apple's hardware and software design process do conversations surrounding accessibility actually start coming into play? Very early and very often, I think is the best answer for that. Our teams are really you know, embedded in developing everything that we do at Apple. So regardless of whether it's hardware or software, we engage with every team that we can to make sure that they're thinking through every possible use case so that as each thing is built, if we're looking at where we have to think about what if somebody might not see this device? What if they might not hear this device? What if they might not touch this device? How are they going to interact with it in the way that works best for them. And so the team is constantly coming up with super creative ideas to solve those problems. Sarah's answer here completely tracks for me because as a tech content creator, I get to use a lot of different types of tech on many different types of platforms, more so than any other normal person usually would. And as a result, I've noticed personally that Apple's implementation of many accessibility features has a level of polish and intentionality and intuitiveness that is just either lacking or completely missing on these other platforms. That entire aspect to Apple's approach to accessibility is the defining reason why I tend to gravitate more towards using Apple products in my daily life for accessibility related use cases. A great way to think about this is that if you're a person who absolutely needs to use these accessibility features to get anything done, it feels like you're being punished or penalized for using these features if they just feel like a tacked on afterthought. Whereas if the platforms themselves feel like they've natively been built from the ground up with these accessibility features in mind, you feel like the tech is working for you and not the other way around, which is how it's always supposed to be. This line of conversation actually led me to ask a question that wasn't on my agenda initially, and it was about how a little while back, Apple actually gave AirPods Pro 2 the ability to be used as clinical grade hearing aid devices for people who are hard of hearing. My question was essentially, was the ability for Apple to use AirPods Pro as clinical grade hearing aids an original intention for the product or did it come up later on? Yeah, well, I think we're always trying to look at where a product is today and where it's heading into the future. And our team can kind of, in some ways, be kids in the candy store looking at what every other team is working on and see how we can use it best. When we saw how many people were using them and the potential of the, the hardware inside of it, we realized that this was something that could really benefit from this work around hearing health and adding in all the different elements from protection to the hearing test to the hearing aid capability. So it's something that I think, you know, it, it's been a progression over time. Back in 2014, we actually started the Made for iPhone hearing aid program, which revolutionized the hearing industry. But now as we've gone farther and farther, we've really been able to do some amazing things with the AirPods Pro 2. My interview with Sarah actually happened around the same time as a Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is actually the same time when Apple previews some of the new accessibility features coming to later versions of their platforms, such as iOS, iPadOS, macOS, and basically basically everything else. And speaking of using existing technological platforms for furthering accessibility use cases, one of the new features Apple previewed was Zoom in Vision OS. Now something that I find really cool is that sometimes these accessibility features kind of find their way into the mainstream. And a really cool example of that is BackTap, the ability to tap on the back of your iPhone to perform a various number of shortcuts. And so one of my questions for Sarah was, are there any more of these examples of features which were originally intended as accessibility related use cases that somehow found their way into the mainstream and became generally popular features. When we first design features, we always make them for a specific community because our goal is always to be the accessibility solution for someone for whom they need this to be able to get the most out of their technology. But we often find that that which is accessibility to one person can be a great productivity hack for someone else. And so 
We also, you know, we'll hear about people out there in the world who will find a feature and suddenly it blows up on social or things like that. Um, I think some good examples of that would be even things like how inverting colors, one of the things we started doing years and years ago, be kind of kind of became the precursor for things like dark mode, or how we created assistive touch on Apple Watch as a way for individuals who are upper body limb different, those who are amputees or um, you know might really just be using a watch one handed. We figured out how to use the hardware underneath the watch to be able to drive it using just a, a clench or a pinch. And that over time became kind of the, the core for double tap on the watch now. So we you know, certainly do see situations where people really just fall in love with a feature who might not be the original constituents we built it for, but if, if people are getting value out of it, it kind of becomes a great gateway for people to just open up the accessibility settings and find out if there are things in there that really could be a value to them. And finally, to end things off, I asked Sarah, what meaningful measures or provisions does Apple have to ensure a full and continued commitment to furthering accessibility goals that may be going under the radar, but are still integral in Apple's approach to accessibility as a whole? I think one of the, the biggest things for us is the fact that Accessibility has been a part of our DNA for 40 years. Our first Office of Disability was started in 1985. So this is something that we have been doing for a really long time. And actually even just for a little historical context, 1985 was actually five years before the Americans with Disabilities Act even came to pass. So our commitment to this has always been because we believe that you make the best technology when you make it for everyone. Now I've been doing accessibility here at Apple for almost 20 years. And one of the things that I've been very proud of in the time frame that I've been here is how much that core value has been deeply embedded into our culture. And you know, one of the things that I always appreciate the most is when I hear from somebody in you know, a meeting I wasn't even in saying, there was a moment where somebody said, has anybody thought about the accessibility implications of this? Or you know, let's think about this community as we're designing this. And I think that really is something that is so deeply embedded in who we are. We wanna make sure that we're bringing in the right people to help us build the right tools. And that collaboration is not just within our own you know, company, but it's also about collaborating outside. So we do a lot of work with outside organizations to ensure that we're really understanding what the needs of our communities are. I'd like to extend a massive thanks to Apple for setting this all up and for Sarah for sitting down with me to have this very important conversation. And for you guys as well, if you wanna like ask any questions or continue this really important discussion on accessibility in tech, make sure to leave a comment down below. But apart from that, if you want me to cover more accessibility in tech, let me know as well, because it's something that I'm definitely open to do. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.